I was just going to tell you a, a funny court thing, a story that I had, maybe a couple of police stories. Are you interested in hearing that? Yeah. Yeah. And then we're going to hand over and we're going to have a bit of a laugh just before lunch. We're going to do some laughter treatment. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when I came across this information, uh, I think I told you I, I had to pull out of the business that I was in and I started studying it and I got quite depressed about it. Um, but then I actually started to come into how powerful we are and started to use it in bits and pieces of my life. And um, one of the first times was um, when Steph and I met, um, my former partner was very upset about that and she took out a domestic violence order against me for no reason because I'm so violent. And, um, which was very uh, traumatic, but anyway she did. And so I ended up having to go to court. So the police actually turned up to our house and um, we knew they were coming because they came to our old house and the people told us that they were coming. So we knew that the Gestapo were coming for me. And um, they came to where we had an acreage property and Steph answered the door and Steph had just learnt this information. So I'd sort of kind of taught her what to say, but she got a bit nervous. Anyway, the police knocked on the door and they said, is, is such and such here? And she said, well, that person doesn't live here. A person doesn't live anywhere because it's a corporation which is dead, right? So she's, she's not incorrect in what she said. And they asked her a few more questions and, they, and, and Steph said, well, look, there's other properties, there's other dwellings on this big acreage, go and maybe look there. But they were quite forthright, you know, not friendly. Big loud knock at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Anyway, 10 minutes later, they come back, bang, bang, bang on the door. And Steph opens the door and they said, uh, how does it feel to lie to police? And Steph said, excuse me? And then they pulled out mail that had both of our names on it in all capital letters. <laughs> And, um, and Steph said, well, I didn't lie to police. That person doesn't live here. Anyway, a little bit of uh, rhetoric went on between, t between the two. And uh, eventually, Steph said, um, well, I've answered uh, all the questions I want to answer today, so I bid you good day. And they said, oh, don't give me that English or hoity-toity conversation. You're an Australian now. And they started getting quite sort of uh, getting into character assassination. And then Steph tried to close the door and they put their foot in the door. There was two female officers and said, uh, move away from the door. We're going to search the property. And, and uh, Steph said, well, I'd like to see a search warrant. We don't need a search warrant. And Steph said, well, can you show me the law that's changed that, say, that says you don't need a search warrant? And she pulled her mace out and held it right to Steph's face and said, move or we'll spray you. So if you don't think we live in a police state, then have a chat with Steph over lunch. Now, I'm standing in, in the kitchen and that, that was enough for me. Um, they, they, they walked in as I sort of came around from the kitchen and they said, are you, you know, uh, called out the corporate entity's name? And I said, uh, that person doesn't live here. And they said, we want to see some ID. And I said, will you show me under uh, Admiralty Maritime Law where privacy isn't one of the highest forms of law and where I need to provide you any information uh, in my own home? And they just looked at me like I was a, a lunatic. Anyway, they... Um, they proceeded to read out this document that I had to appear in court, and so I then had a bit of fun with them. Um, this is in the early days of me getting this information. But I just went, la, 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 <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> um, and then uh, eventually they tried to hand it to me, and I said, well, I'm not contracting with you, and they just threw it on the floor. And I said, well, you've just littered now. And I said, um, you know, you've got your, your strange costumes on with a corporate entity on the badge your little Gestapo uniforms, it's time for you to go. And they left very uh, abruptly. So that was, that was Steph's first um, introduction to all this sort of stuff. So who's surprised to hear that they pulled Mace out? I mean, it, firstly, it's an allegation on somebody that wasn't even her, and they were going to spray her in the face with Mace. So we've got their details, and we've definitely got something we could go to the federal police and, and push forward with, but onto, onto better things. So anyway, then I turned up to court and uh, had quite a few of my clients with me. <laughs> who wanted to see what was going to go on. Um, and so a little friend of the court comes up, I think who's a volunteer, and says, are you aware of your three options here today? I said, no. So he read it out, which was to, I think, admit guilt or something, or ask for an adjournment, or ask for a hearing. I think that's what it was, the three options. I can't even remember. But um, I said, thank you. So then I got called into court, and as I went into court, the police persecutor was there. Uh, prosecutor, sorry, Freudian slip. <laughs> the police uh, prosecutor was there, and as I walked in, um, she said to me, uh, are, you Mark, are you Mark James Darwin? And uh, I said, well, I'm commonly known as Mark James of the family Darwin, because she tried to identify me as a corporate entity. Okay? And she looked at me and said, what? Um, 
And then what I will say, though, is the magistrate looked up straight away. She knew straight away she had an escaped, escaped slave in the courtroom. And she said, are you Mark James Darwin? And I said, well, I'll repeat, I'm commonly known as Mark James of the family Darwin. And she said, sit. I said, well, I'll sit of my own volition, not because you've commanded me to. You can't have them command you to do anything. And then uh, she said, and who's this? Because uh, Steph was there and said, that's my fiancé, Stephanie. Now, she turned to the other party, the aggrieved. Anything with a vowel and two consonants means no. So the aggrieved is no grieved. Respondent, re means no. Responder means speak. So somebody who can't speak and somebody with no grievance in a fictitious court, we're off to a good start. Um, she turned to the aggrieved and said, are you happy for this person to be here? And the magistrate said, actually, senior constable, uh, I'll be making that decision. And she said to Steph, stand up. And Steph stood up. So she she's, uh, joined herself, asked her a few questions, and then she said, clear the court. She cleared the court of all public people. Um, and then she proceeded to ask me, Mr. Mr. Darwin, are you aware of your three options here today? And uh, I said uh, words to the effect of, Your Honour, you've addressed me as Mr. Darwin. Uh, I'm here to surrender and hold you in bondage uh, with my agent and commerce's um, documents, being my birth certificate, my passport and my driver's licence. And I'm here to notice the court that uh, I'm not a nom de guerre nor a corporation. I'm a flesh and blood, spirit-filled being and I'm alive and well. <laughs> anyway, just so you know, as soon as I first noticed the court who, that I knew who I was, she never made eye contact with me again, because eye contacting is, it can even be seen as, as uh, contracting. Uh, so uh, this went on. She asked me a couple of questions. And it got to the stage where I said, Your Honour, is it not the case that you're entering controversy into a matter where I've clearly noticed the court that I'm alive and well, and I don't wish to be joined to an agent in commerce or dead, uh, dead corporation? She said nothing. And I said, I take it by your silence that you agree to that and let the court record show. And she started to get furious. And this police prosecutor's just looking at me going, what? Who is this boy? He's on drugs. Um, and... Uh, I think the pro prosecutor was probably amazed that I wasn't being held in contempt of court and being taken away. Uh, but uh, anyway, so this went on for a little while and then um, I, I eventually said to her, Your Honour, have you not tested me? And the, the Bible says Peter was tested three times before the cock crowed. Have you not tested me more than three times and have I not made it clear as to my identity uh, in the court today? I take it by your silence, I have. And I'd like the matter set aside, right? So this went on for a little while. Eventually... Um, uh, things proceeded, and uh, at the end of it, I said, Your Honour, where can I get a copy of today's transcripts? Next case. Your Honour, where can I get a... Next case! And she raised her voice and really yelled at me. So I just walked out having a, a, a bit of a giggle. But it was, it was interesting for me because I'd intellectualised some of this information, but to intellectualise something and not have done it is two very different things. So it was a big, deep breath, and even for, for me, I was a little bit nervous on that first count. But um, I've been back to court uh, a few times representing clients, and because the courts know who I am now, I get ejected. <laughs> um, the last one was with a client who was falsely served uh, with documents. Uh, his, actually, his 15-year-old son was served uh, at his ex-wife's house, so he had no knowledge of any service being executed. The first he heard of it was a, uh, a judgment order that came through. So he rang me and said, what do we do? I said, we'll appeal it. So we appealed it. Um, we got, wrote an affidavit uh, in support, evidencing that he hadn't been given service, and so off we went to court together. Now, he treated with the court, or he noticed the court more than 10 days in advance that I would be coming to uh, assist him in court. Uh, so when we got to court, um, he got called up. I actually had to race to the bathroom. The magistrates are never on time, except this day. Um, and uh, he got called up, and because of the way we wrote the letters, and you'll see this afternoon, the way we write is different to how the mainstream is right, uh, the judge knew that, that she had another escaped slave in the, uh, in the courtroom. So what she did was this was a, 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 all matters uh, up for um, being set aside or um, adjourned. So she called my client up and uh, effectively said, just go to the back of the room and you'll be, you'll be last. And that's what happened. There was five other matters before us because they don't want anyone else hearing these proceedings. Right? Well, you're aware of that. I know you've had a lot to do with this. Um, and uh, so anyway, we're sitting there and there was two other similar matters where proper service hadn't been executed, okay? And she set the matters aside, the, the magistrate. She was a lady of about probably 60, 65, little hair with glasses and, and set them aside, so that's all good. So my client, Leo, sitting next to me and said, well, are you going to come up with me? I said, yeah, of course I can. And he said, actually, I'm, I'm feeling all right. I might do this on my own because he's been studying with us for a while and come to a few study groups. 
oh, okay, that's good. So he get, everyone else is out and all that's left in the courtroom is Leo and I and this young uh, solicitor from the other side. So uh, he gets called up and he, he stands up there and before he gets out a word, edgewise, this lovely uh, magistrate's demeanour changes and she, and she leans over her half-room glasses and she says, let me tell you, Mr... I won't say his name. Uh, I won't be striking this matter, nor setting it aside. I don't know where you had that notion. And in fact, I'll be adjourning the court right now and uh, coming b back to find out what the maximum court costs I can award you for wasting the courts and the other side's time today. And he was standing, he didn't get a word in. Right? So she went out, she adjourned the court, and he turned to me and went, I said, speak, you've got to speak. And he froze, even though he's been studying this stuff. It's still, you've got to understand, courts can be quite a fearful place if you don't know really, really who you are and can think and talk on your feet. So when she came back in, she sat down, and she's, uh, as she's even sitting down, she says, well, Mr. So-and-so, uh, the maximum court cost is 520. I'm awarding that to you today, and the judgment stands. So I stood up, and I said, Your Honour, may I approach the bench? And she said, no. And uh, I said, well, Your Honour, uh, have, has the court not been noticed well in advance that I could be helping Mr Dim Redder? Sit down or you'll be removed. And I, so I didn't. I just said, um, Your Honour, is it not in your oath of office that you're here to protect my client's rights? And she didn't answer. I said, I take it by your silence that you are, and let the court record show that you are here to protect his rights. I said, has the other side produced an affidavit in rebuttal to this affidavit in support? They haven't. Is it not the case that an unrebutted affidavit stands as law? Why are you railroading the law procedure here and awarding maximum court costs to somebody without even looking at his affidavit? Anyway, then she said, uh, she said to the clerk, call security. Uh, so I got a few more sentences out and then security came and, and took me away. But, um, you know, luckily enough, it was enough that in my absence, she actually turned their maximum court cost to the other side and set the, the matter for an adjournment, and then we went back two weeks later for the um, hearing, and the matter was set aside. But you really, unless you know who you are and want to stand up for your rights, you will more than likely just be railroaded uh, in, in the system. So, um, one more thing, and I know this is a bit heavy, which is why we're going to do some laughing in a second. I <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't see it as heavy any, any, anymore. I see it as, it, it's just a game. It's just all a game. Uh, unfortunately, they've got guns and battens, and so uh, you sort of got to know who you are. There was another incident where we decided we didn't want to have a registered car anymore. We had an unregistered car, and it was a Sunday afternoon, and um, all of a sudden behind me is an unmarked police car with two uniformed police officers. And they pulled up, uh, there was a big guy and a little guy. A little guy came up beside me and he said, uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, we're conducting a, uh, a, what do you call it, a, a random, uh, no, not breath test, uh, sorry, um, yeah, licence and, and registration check. So, uh, when was this? This was, must be October, November last year. And uh, I said, oh, OK. I, we were on the way to the beach with the dog, and so I was happy to acquiesce to the system. So I pulled out my little piece of plastic with a picture of me and a corporate name next to it. And, uh, and he said, sir, is the vehicle, vehicle, a public word, is the vehicle registered? I said, I'm not really sure it's not my car. And he said, well, whose is it? I said, what's well, this being here? Steph was sitting next to me. And he and Lyndon, he said, uh, is the vehicle registered? And Steph just played, played dumb and said, oh, I'm not really sure, we've, we've moved house. And uh, he said, well, the sticker says it's out of date. She went, C could be. And so he said, well, Mr Darwin, I'm going to just go and do a, a little check. Is there anything you need to tell me? And I said, it's a nice day. <laughs> and he said, anything you need to tell me about you and your background? And I said, man, you, you hop on your radio and you find out whatever you need to, to find out, you know? He's starting to get a little bit terse with us by now. So he takes my licence back to the big guy who's in the car, and then he comes around to the Steph side, and he says, uh, um, what's your name? And Steph looks at me, because she hadn't been studying very much, and I said, give him your name, that's okay. What's your address? And then he said, what's your phone number? And I sort of leaned down, I said, mate, what do you need this being's phone number for? She's provided you her date of birth and, uh, and her entity uh, details. And he said, mate, you stay out of it. I'm not required to stay out of anything. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm quite capable of uh, speaking for myself. I said, can you show me the law that says that this being needs to offer you any of this information? And he said, can you show me the law that says it doesn't? And I said, mate, you're the policy enforcer acting on behalf of a corporation, putting your company, po corporation's policies on us. You need to provide us with the information. And then he said, oh, fucking smart ass, are you? Right, he started swearing in front of, in front of Steph. 
And I said, listen, mate, we're, we're journeying the King's highways and byways. We don't mean anybody any injury. And, uh, and we're feeling a little bit intimidated right now. I'm not intimidating you. I said, well, you're leaning into our car and you've got a gun and a baton on your hips and we're feeling intimidated. So he goes back to the car and gets the big bloke, right? And then the big bloke's <laughs> been watching too many episodes of Chips. <laughs> and, he, and he walks up and he says, is there a problem here today? I said, mate, there's no problem with us. You guys clearly have a problem. We're, we're, feeling, uh, we're feeling like you're trying to injure us. They said, you want to step out of the car? Driver, addressed me as driver. And I said, uh, well, I'm happy to surrender to, uh, to that request and stand, but not because you're demanding me to. So I went and stood around. Oh, firstly, I said to him, I just need to notice you, and I'm always calling them by their name. So I just need to notice you, I'm not going to mention the name now because we're on air, uh, that, that since you pulled us over, uh, you've been recorded. Well, the blood just drained out of his face. And uh, Steph will tell you, he, he, his lips went grey. You know when someone's yeah. in that much anger or fear, his lips went grey and started to tremble? And that's when he said, step out of the car. So I came around to the other side of the car and he, and he pointed to the footpath and he said, sit down. I said, mate, I'm not your dog and I don't need to, uh, to, um, uh, to surrender to that sort of uh, abuse. And again, I noticed him that he was uh, very threatening. And he said, how about we take you downtown, downtown, mate, how about we take you downtown for four hours and detain you and see what we can find on you? I said, that's fine. I put my hands behind my back and I said, under what section of the Crimes Act are you detaining me and threatening me and uh, causing my partner here trauma? And he went, oh. I said, mate, I don't mean you any injury, but I can't help you injuring yourself, so you should probably stop talking. And he just got angry and angry. And I know that uh, if I was there on my own, I would have been in the back of that wagon and probably taken off for a nice little uh, phone book experience. Um, but anyway, we, you know, I'd probably even be more animated than I was now. I kept very calm and just kept noticing him and I said, look, you've broken the law. You've made up four laws that I know of. And I said, your professional indemnity insurance doesn't cover you when you act outside the law, so stop talking. And uh, he eventually went back to the car and he came up with a notice to appear. Has anybody got one of those? You get a notice to appear in court and with my license and he tried to hand it back and I said, I'm not contracting with you. I'm not, uh, I'm not part of this, uh, this society. And he threw, again threw it on the ground and I said, well, thank you for littering. So I picked up the document uh, and he drove off. And now the little guy was pretty smart. As soon as he started to hear what I was saying, he stayed right out of it. He, sta he stood over at the car and he was kind of looking at the big bloke going, mate, stop. So the court date was two weeks later and we turned up to Southport Court and in court they normally have all the names of people that need to appear and I'm looking up there looking for my name, hmm, it's not there. So I went to the bathroom, while I'm in the bathroom I'm thinking, I wonder if there's been a little bit of magic here. <laughs> so I went into the registers, registrar's office and, and no case of the matter whatsoever. It absolutely disappeared guys because I had noticed this guy that he'd been recorded, oh he, oh, he wanted to search the car. He said, well, we're going to search the car. I said, where's your search warrant? He said, well, will you, will you uh, authorise and consent to us searching the car? I said, no way. He said, mate, you've got a device, a recording device. We're entitled to take that in the act of a crime. I said, well, number one, constable such and such. It's an alleged crime. And number two, I don't have the recording device. Maybe somebody else has the recording device. I said, no, I'm not authorising you to search the vehicle. Furious. See, they make these laws up all the time. And even one of our clients who's a former police officer said, yeah, we used to make laws up all the time. People don't know. They think we know more than them. So, uh, Did you really have a recording device? No. <laughs> but I do now. I've just, I've just, no, no. Well, you, I've actually just ordered, yeah, OzSpy. Uh, OzSpy, I've just ordered an 8 gig full colour audio spy pen that you can download. And, uh, the button one, yeah. 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 They're, they're one of the bottom blocks of the pyramid. And they, they're just told, address them by driver, address them by this, right, right this way. Yeah, they don't know. And guys, I just need to say, I'm not here to put police down, okay? Because, you know, the police, uh, we do need, I think, some sort of peace officers, um, you know, for things that happen. But... Uh, you know, the ones that want to take the law into their own hand and start intimidating and bullying, I don't have a whole lot of time for, but I certainly do think they, most of them do a wonderful job in uh, keeping things safe. So a lot of us are scared. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I'll show you this afternoon letters that you can send off if you've got speeding fines or parking fines or state penalties enforcement registry um, documents. And um, I don't know how successful they are, but we are getting texts and calls back from our clients going, hey, I just got a letter back from the police saying, oh, we, we apologise, there must have been a technical error and please disregard the, uh, the fine and all sorts of stuff. So there's some really cool letters that we've put together that seem to have some legs. Um, and I got lots of other stories of, of court and, and things like that that I'm happy to share with you at another time.